Hello and welcome to this United States Energy Association virtual press briefing. I am Llewellyn King, uh, uh, the host of White House Chronicle on PBS and a syndicated columnist and a longtime journalist covering energy. It is uh, my delight to tell you that we have today an extraordinary panel of experts and an equally extraordinary panel of journalists to examine the subject of energy supply, electric supply. Uh, we know it's the demand is going up. Is the electricity going to be there or is it going to be a patchy, dark future? Before we get going, I'd like to ask Mark Menzies, President and Chief Executive Officer of the U.S. Energy Association, to tell us something about the group and to welcome you. Mark? Thank you, Llewellyn, and welcome everyone to the USEA's virtual press briefing on the U.S.'s electricity supply and efforts to meet our increasing demands. We're happy to host such a panel of experts and journalists on such an important and timely topic. And before we begin, just a few words about USEA. We're a nonprofit, nonpartisan institution founded back in 1924 uh, as a member of the World Energy Council. Uh, we convene and conduct forums and workshops for the public, our members, and energy stakeholders, and we sponsor educational events such as today's press briefing. USEA also supports global access to affordable, reliable, and sustainable energy in partnership with the U.S. government, including the U.S. Agency for International Development, the Department of Energy, uh, and the Department of State, among other agencies. You can learn more about us at usea.org. And with that, back to Luella. Thank you, Mark. I would like to thank the USEA staffers, Melissa Brown, who you met, Hunter Budd, and Kimberly Grover for their help in organizing these briefings. We'll go straight to the questions uh, after I have mentioned who we have on. And our panel is Daniel Brooks, Vice President, Integrated Grid and Energy Systems at EPRI, Jim Robb, President and CEO of NERC, NERC, the uh, projections agency and disciplinarian of electricity supply, if you will. Dan Brulette, president and CEO of the Edison Electric Institute. Todd Schnitzler, president and CEO of the Electric Power Supply Association. Christopher Wellies, vice president for sustainability at Equinox, the large uh, data center company. And David Naylor, President of the Rayburn Electric Cooperative close to Dallas, and David Shreshla, excuse me, Shreshla, President, Northern Virginia Cooperative. And David, if I mispronounced your name, I apologize, uh, and we'll, we'll get it sorted out. Our reporters are Jennifer Hiller, The Wall Street Journal, Matt Chester, Energy Central, Ken Silverstein, Forbes, Evan Harper, Evan Harper, The Washington Post. Peter Bear, e, e News, and Adam Clayton Powell III of PBS. And welcome to the broadcast all. Let's begin with Jennifer with the first question. Thanks so much. I really appreciate this. I have a question for Jim, uh, for Jim Robb. I'm wondering, given the kind of data center um, growth that we're seeing across the country and the fact that um, a lot of it appears to be, or most of it appears to be sort of inflexible in demand response programs. I'm just curious how you guys are looking at reliability for the for the rest of the system. So that is a, a great and very timely question. Um, two, two aspects to that that we're uh, uh, looking into. The first is just the impact on the overall resource addict questions that, uh, that we've been flagging in our reliability assessments for the last five to six years. You know, our, all of our assessments have largely been off of uh, flat to very modest growth rate uh, for electricity consumption. That changed last year with our long-term reliability assessment that started to show material growth. Um, I think when we pour the new assessment this year, we'll see that tick up even further with all the data center load that's being discussed and talked about. So it exacerbates all the reliability challenges around resource adequacy and uh, the transition from kind of spinning mass uh, uh, traditional generation to uh, to renewables. 
the, the second issue that we're concerned about is just the individual scale of these facilities. And as you point out, they are inflexible, uh, right? They're, they're large, undiversified loads. And, and, and we've seen and heard reports of interconnection requests, you know, on the order of a gigawatt to a gigawatt and a half. And, and to put that in perspective, a gigawatt is about the entire load of the city of San Francisco. So these are very, very large loads uh, that are seeking to interconnect and they're not diverse, right? So it's the, the load is either on or off. That has a potential to create stability issues for the grid. Um, if, they, uh, if they did cycle on and off, you know, through some, uh, 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 some mechanism, uh, it raises questions around cybersecurity protections for those facilities. So there are a number of things we want to look into to make sure that as we accommodate these loads, which are terrific for a whole bunch of uh, reasons related to AI and expansion of technology, that we've got our eye on the reliability implications of, of adding such large loads onto the system. I think that cries out for a comment um, from Daniel, uh, uh, big upon from Christopher Willis and Equinix. Christopher? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Llewellyn. Llewellyn. Well, you know, I think, first of all, it's important to really sort of level set, you know, um, the importance of data centers really to modern civilization, right? So they, they really truly are the backbone of today's economy. Uh, while they do consume significant amounts of energy, they house all the critical IT infrastructure and all the physical and virtual systems, networks, applications, and overhead that makes them operational, making them really critical to today's society. And they do operate, uh, as Jim mentioned, 24 by 7, 365, supporting a whole wide range of essential services from the life-saving work in hospitals to first responders to powering global financial markets managing food and pharmaceutical production, and so on. Uh, you know, not to mention, of course, entertainment, communication, and all the other things that, uh, that uh, folks rely upon. So I think it's really critical that we sort of balance the consumption of the data centers uh, that, that, uh, that are in, on the system, on the grid, uh, with, with the critical services that they are providing, as well as the technologies that can aid in things like grid optimization, uh, onboarding of renewables and so on. Thank you. Uh, Matt Chester, Energy Central. Thanks, Llewellyn. And, and yeah, I want to kind of stay on on that AI topic. And yeah, you know, we're we're still relatively early in 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 the explosion of that common AI use. And so we're all hearing about it on a on a daily basis and in, including the potential risks that come from increased energy demand from AI. So I, I just wanted to press further for our panelists to maybe share any, you know, what are some tried and true strategies or best practices to manage AI's energy demand while ensuring that grid reliability and affordability. And then on the other side, you know, are there abilities that are brought by the AI technology uh, that can, you know, find opportunities to better save and manage energy use across the grid? Anybody want to take that? I'll, I'll take a first stab at it. Um, you know, first of all, I think we have to have our eyes open to, we know what we know today. And, and today we've got the, the issue around, you know, AI consumes 10 times the energy of a Google search, right? I don't know if that number is exactly right, but that's the number that's talked about. What we need to keep in mind is over time, we're going to see a couple dynamics. One, the chips will get better, right? The CEO of NVIDIA has already talked about significant improvements in the next generation chips on their energy consumption relative to their capability. I, I think we should, have, and he's kind of created Wong's law, right? That uh, we'll see that continue to improve over time, which makes sense to me. Second thing is um, algorithms will also get better over time. We saw this with the internet. When the internet was first coming into uh, broad scale uh, adoption in the 90s and, and early 2000s, we had similar concerns around electricity demand that largely didn't actually occur because the chips got better, the algorithms got better, we will see something similar happen with the AI chips as well, I'm sure. I think that still means we're, we're gonna see substantial load growth, but it's probably not as dramatic as uh, we, we think right now, uh, just because we'll learn as uh, time moves on. Thank you. Ken Silverstein, Forbes. A lot of questions, um, Llewellyn. I'll just, my most immediate though is, 
the the experts say the grid has to expand by an exponential number, which I don't have at my fingertips. Uh, we're talking about grid optimization as well. So will this expansion of the grid and grid optimization happen at a fast enough pace to meet the expected future demand, which will come not just AI, but also electric vehicles and just decarbonization generally? So what is the question, Ken? The, the question is, will the grid expand at the rate it needs to expand to accommodate the expected growth from AI, electric vehicles, and decarbonization generally? Daniel Brooks, I think that's a question for you. Yeah, yeah thanks, Llewellyn. So uh, will the grid expand? Uh, it will expand, but it also has to be a coordinated expansion, right? So some of these very near-term AI data center requests, they're significant. Uh, Jim earlier said they're hearing of, of service requests of one to one and a half gigawatts. Uh, we, we just recently surveyed a, a lot of uh, utilities here in the U.S. and globally. We're, we're hearing data service requests on the order of four to five gigawatts uh, for, for co-located facilities. That, that's uh, a significant requirement in terms of additional supply and delivery capacity that has to be planned, um, cited, permitted, uh, and constructed. And the timelines uh, for the development of the data centers themselves uh, on the order of those requests typically are one to two, maybe three years. Uh, you, you know from other conversations, it, it takes longer than that to actually get uh, new supply facilities and new delivery facilities, transmission facilities actually cited, permitted, and built. Uh, we're, we're hearing even like gas turbine OEMs right now, you're, you're looking anywhere from, if you're putting a request today and your request are, isn't already in, we're hearing it's on the order of, of three to five years uh, before you're likely to have a gas turbine. Well, th those data centers come in much more quickly than that. So I, I would just say, I think it's really, really important. It was said earlier that these are um, 24-7, 365 loads, and that's true, but the flexibility of those loads and the potential to be able to flex those loads are really, really important in terms of how we actually plan and allowing the grid the time that's needed in order to be able to expand to meet those. Uh, and I think coordination between the, the data center community and stakeholders and the utility community is going to be really key to ensure that the grid can expand to reliably and affordably meet that over the timelines that are needed. Thank you. Uh, Evan Halper, The Washington Post. Hi, good morning. Um, since you just mentioned gas, um, a question I have, I mean, looking at these um, projections from like Goldman Sachs and Wells Fargo that show just a tremendous amount of gas coming online um, between now and 2030 to manage this data center load. And I think Goldman Sachs projected it would have to be like 60% managed by gas. Um, is there general agreement that that's the only way to do this at this at this point? Does there need to be this much gas? Because obviously you bring in all this gas, it brings a tremendous amount of emissions. Um, and then getting the grid decarbonized by 2035 just seems like it, it can't happen. So are these projections of this much gas uh, pretty much baked in? Is this the way it has to be? Or is this the way utilities want it? I'd like to take that. How about you, Dan Berlant? You're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, indeed. Okay, sorry about that. Look, no I, I think uh, natural gas is going to be part of the portfolio. It's going to be part of the stack uh, in the near term. You know, whether the near term is defined as five or 10 years or 15 or 20 years uh, is anyone's guess. But um, I, I, don't, I don't suggest to you that that's what utilities want. Um, that's just what is required by the physics. Uh, of the of the problems that we're facing today, um, there's no way to stabilize the grid uh, today without the use of some firm based load power, and that includes natural gas. So, um, I, I think that you know, as, as I see it here, uh, fully decarbonizing the grid, fully decarbonizing electricity production in the United States, uh, is probably not going to happen by 2030. It's certainly not going to happen 
by 2032, and it probably won't happen by 2035. Um, those are some very ambitious goals, in my view. That won't. That does not suggest for a second that we won't make every effort uh, to reduce emissions and to continue the path toward decarbonization. However, it's just a realization of the of the physics in which we're faced. I, if I could back up just for a second, though, um, Llewellyn, you had asked the question, or someone had asked the question about can we meet the demand? Um, you know, there's some historical precedents here as we think about AI and we think about data centers and we think about the amount of load coming on. You know, I've seen estimates that, you know, this will perhaps be 5% or perhaps even 10% of the nation's electricity generation uh, will be consumed by AI or consumed by data centers. There's historical precedent in the Manhattan Project. Uh, the K-25 facility down at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, a gas diffusion uh, facility was built uh, to help the nation uh, continue to develop nuclear warheads during a period of Cold War. Uh, those facilities, uh, both at Oak Ridge and Paducah, Kentucky, and other places like that, consumed about 10% of the nation's electricity demand. And in order to meet that demand and to meet the urgency of the Cold War, uh, we developed a lot of production. TVA, in particular, developed the Kin Kingston facility down in uh, Knoxville, Oak Ridge, Tennessee. We know how to do this. Uh, the questions, you know, I think of, of meeting the demand are easy to answer in some respects. We know what we need to do. We need more production facilities. We need more infrastructure to deliver the electrons from point A to point B. It boils down to a question of political will. Are we going to allow the permitting of these facilities? We know how to build them. They can be built. America's utilities and electric utilities are, in my view, the best in the world at building this type of infrastructure. The question is whether we're going to allow them to build it. Thank you. Um Peter Bear, Ian the News. Uh, good morning. Uh, thanks to the panelists. Um, I wanted to go to the question of the regulation of carbon emissions from coal plants uh, and uh, the EPA uh, rule on that that Dan, your organization has uh, challenged. And um, Jim Robb has pointed out that some coal plants are absolutely essential to uh, keep online at least for the foreseeable future, uh, until um, other forms of power can be found to replace them, which could be three or four, uh, five years uh, in the case of transmission. So the question for uh, Jim Robb and, and Dan uh, for you is, um, are there certain gas, sorry, are there certain coal plants that have to be retained uh, but does that apply to all of them? Should we have a more targeted uh, strategy for uh, grid reliability to maintain the fossil plants that uh, are going to be uh, essential uh, looking ahead for the next, uh, the rest of this decade? And, and then the other ones, uh, the, the carbon emissions could be abated. Uh, shall we start with Jim Rob and then go to Dan Burlett? Sure. So, so there are a couple issues in here, Pete. First of all, uh, the location of certain plants is ap ap makes them absolutely critical. A great example playing out right now is the Brandon Shores coal plant in the uh, Boston Inner Harbor, uh, which is slated for retirement uh, in the next two years. There's not a good alternative there. Uh, there there's, there's not gas to replace it with a gas turbine. It'll take four to five years to get transmission built to uh, reinforce that area with transmission. So they're going to need to figure out a way to extend the life of that particular. More broadly with coal plants, the issue is not so much the plants themselves, but the services they provide. Coal plants provide a tremendous amount of kilowatt hours, uh, which, is, which need to be replaced and can be replaced with other fuels. What's harder to replace are what we call the essential reliability services they provide. Uh, the, the spinning mass inertia, the frequency uh, response, the uh, uh, their ability to create voltage and uh, support voltage. In theory, those services can be provided by other um, by other technologies as well. But until we're able, as we kind of pull any of these individual plants out, we got to be mindful that we got to replace not just the energy they provide, but also the reliability benefits that they provide to the grid. And that's why we get concerned about uh, the, the loss of traditional generation. Well, I guess yeah. my question was whether there are particular 
plants that are like the Brandon Shores plant uh, in Baltimore, uh, or is your concern apply to all the current uh, uh, coal plants, which are responsible for about half of the carbon emissions in the electric power sector? Is it some or all of them? Dan Burlett, would you like to tackle that? You know, I, I, I don't know that I can answer that question directly. Uh, I defer to Jim and his expertise on, you know, the effects on reliability and whatnot. But um, if I could just opine quickly on the lawsuit that was brought by EEI, um, the, the purpose of the lawsuit is simply to demonstrate or to challenge uh, the EPA's interpretation of the statute, the, the Energy Policy Act of 2005, which um, we're honored to have uh, the author of actually on this phone call. Um, Mark's language is very, very clear, uh, suggesting that carbon capture, um, I think the statute says, Mark, correct me if I'm wrong, has been demonstrated. And when we looked at the statute and we looked at the record that was created by EPA, it was very clear that the record could not demonstrate clearly uh, that the technology was widely available and had been demonstrated in the marketplace. Uh, on, a, on a large scale basis. So that's the reason we brought the lawsuit. It wasn't to advance or uh, to protect certain types of generation. Mark, are you going to add to that? Oh, uh, yeah, that was language with respect to, uh, you know, carbon capture uh, technology. And so uh, we just wanted to, Congress, I think, wanted to make sure that it had to be demonstrated before it became part of a, a you know, a requirement. And that, that was typical with uh, all new technologies uh, at that time. Thank you. Uh, Adam Clayton Powell III. Thank you, Lowell. I'd like to ask a question about the very immediate future. Uh, we hear from uh, David Naylor and others. Uh, I think uh, David said that we're barely keeping our heads above water. Uh, Jim, uh, Rob, I look at your report uh, published, most recent report published last winter, uh, which has a, a similar similar sentiment, but uh, uh, in more technical language. But in one particular area of your uh, winter report, you said that for New England, quote, the 2024 winter supply risk would be an issue. What, what does that mean? So, so New England feels uh, more so than most of the country, all the pressures around winter, uh, winter operations. They are fuel constrained. They have very, uh, a very undiverse fuel mix. They're highly dependent on natural gas. And as uh, we see these kind of very cold weather systems uh, hit the country, such as Uri, such as Elliot, such as Jerry and Heather uh, earlier this year, we see uh, significant stress during those days hit the natural gas system. And New England, as the furthest away from kind of natural gas production uh, with very limited pipeline capacity, they're at great risk of um, having energy shortfalls if indeed they got hit by one of these uh, polar vortex events. They've been fortunate over the last three years, the events have been further to the West um, so haven't impacted them as greatly as they have places like Texas, the Midwest, and so forth. But it's a real risk for them and, and one that's going to take them a while to build their way out of. Thank you. Did, did, um, we, did, did, did we have to divert uh, natural gas or rebalance natural gas supplies last winter in New England? No, last, last winter was a fairly mild winter for New England overall. And uh, they did not have any supply issues related to natural gas. Um, Ken Silverstein, you had a question. Oh, I, well, I mean, I have many questions, but I didn't, I wasn't raising my hand. I was scratching my face. Uh, but if you're calling on me, I'll go ahead and ask. It, it, along the uh, the lines of um, what Peter was asking, the, the, the rural co-op group relies on coal or its members rely on coal. And what is its stance in terms of decarbonization and its effect it might have on its member, its members? So, so I'll I'll jump in and and, and tackle it uh, on on our side, and I, I can 
I can tell you from, I mean, from Rayburn's standpoint, we actually have no coal in our mix, um, but we're, we look at decarbonization. Uh, you know, it's, it's the, the challenge for us. And I think Dan uh, mentioned it pretty, pretty well. You know, for us, we're growing about 10% a year just in uh, organic growth. And then you add the, the these data centers that are coming in and, and they are basically doubling or even tripling our overall size. And, you know, you, you look at what resources and what's available to meet those needs and you're driven by the current technology. We, we, we look down the road and, you know, we're, we're, we're implementing the solar and some renewables into our portfolio. But to meet the immediate need, it's the, the challenge is what's the, where's the technology is at? And what's available to meet that as well as, you know, just from a supply chain standpoint, I think that was mentioned as well. You know, sometimes our uh, transformers and, and uh, circuit switchers, you know, you're, you're three years out just to get one if you order it today. Yeah. I, I, can, I can add to that from, from the Northern Virginia side. Uh, we do not own generation. We're in a, a, a distribution only cooperative so we get our power supply out of the PJM marketplace. So our uh, power supply portfolio pretty much mirrors the power supply portfolio of PJM, which is 50 to 60 percent natural gas, maybe uh, 20 to 30 percent coal and 20, 30 percent nuclear with about 10 percent renewable. Um, so clearly, clearly we we're in, we're a natural gas driven organization here. Uh, but uh, but seeing an awful lot of renewable coming in with offshore wind, which uh, is going to be an integration challenge without uh, base load generation. Hey, David, can I add to while you're up, can I ask you, how are you accommodating the large number of data centers in northern uh, northern Virginia? Uh, are they impacting Novak? So, so it's it's a huge impact. Uh, we we were a thousand megawatt cooperative about six years ago. We're now a two thousand megawatt cooperative, on the way to about eight thousand. Um, so it is it's actually it's our it's our engine it's our engine of of, of growth. Uh, Northern Virginia was residential commercial. Now it's data centers, and we're seeing about. 15 to 20 percent uh, compounded growth here in demand. Uh, it's a huge challenge around land management. Uh, uh, it is also a huge supply chain challenge. David mentioned transformers. Uh, I have, uh, uh, I, I can't say how many, but I've got many transformers and lead time on power transformers is out beyond three and a half to four years. Circuit breakers out beyond three and a half to four years. And someone mentioned how long it takes a data a data center can build their facility in about a year and a half, but it takes me about four years to build a uh, a substation to 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 connect. Thank you, uh, Christopher. Do you want to add anything there? Uh, the role of the and and how you feel about it? Sure. We just mentioned, you know, I think it's connecting a couple of dots here. Really, the role of policy, right? So, I mean, I think the good news is that policymakers are really drawing a straight line between power availability and maintaining U.S. leadership in technology like artificial intelligence. And they've noted that if we fail to solve for power availability, we really risk ceding this leadership to foreign adversaries who who can and will solve for this, right? So, it's great that we're having this discussion today. Um, I think, you know, um, no one's mentioned it yet, but I know it's on the tip of everyone's tongue. You know, from a power generation perspective, there's widespread bipartisan agreement that nuclear power can and should provide a sizable portion of our nation's future carbon-free baseload energy mix. So I'd love to hear some of the uh, other experts sort of mention that. Um, and from a transmission perspective, you know, you know, FERC had advanced some rule changes which will accelerate uh, some of the permitting process uh, and speed up the planning process. Uh, and and uh, Senators Manchin and Barrasso uh, may be close to unveiling permitting and citing a citing deal, which could modernize uh, and speed up the approval process as well. So all, I think, sort of important elements, but I think don't want to lose sight of really the North Star that while we're in sort of this perfect storm for demand for green electrons, this is something that is really critical to national security and I think important for US 
to maintain our leadership position in technologies like artificial intelligence. Thank you very much. Jennifer Hillo. I have a, another question for David Naylor. Um, I know you guys bought a gas plant last year or so um, and that you had reliability concerns, um, especially in the winter. And I'm just wondering like with the growth that you've seen, um, I guess, is is that gas plant sort of spoken for already? Are you are you looking at, at building, are you trying to build more gas? What, um, what are you, you know, I'm just curious what, what the status of that, that newest gas plant is for you? Yeah, we, uh, Jennifer, it is, uh, to, to use your phrase, it is spoken for, um, and uh, we are actively looking at, at uh, future generation. And in fact, here in Texas, there's the Texas Energy Fund that the, the state legislature approved last year. Uh, Rayburn is actually the only cooperative that submitted a notice of intent uh, with with the idea of let's see if we can utilize that as well. So we're we're definitely looking down the road and and uh, and, and I mean we we need we need more resources to meet our current needs, uh, let alone as these additional uh, data centers and stuff uh, you know come into our system. You know I mean I think one of the things that we we try to balance here, and I think Christopher had mentioned it. I mean, we're utilizing a lot more data in and of our in our own operations to make things more efficient, and frankly, trying to get into the hands of our members to encourage them in terms of you know give them the information they need and maybe they want to adjust and meet uh, make their operations more efficient as well. And so that's you know it's, we have this this dichotomy here. We got, we got to balance the reliability. We got to make sure that if we have another winter storm, Yuri, and there's a load shed event, who, uh, who who's going to curtail and who's not, and as well as uh, you know, just me, me, we have an obligation to serve, and that's that's where we have to rise to the challenge of. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Todd. You represent large consumers. How do they feel about the uh, tightening of supply? Actually, Llewellyn, we represent competitive power generators. So like our utility cousins, we own generating assets of all types in all the restructured markets around the country. So from California to Texas to the Mid-Atlantic to New England, and our members find themselves in the position of trying to meet the demand requirements of additional load, which we have not seen in 20 years or so. And now we are finding ourselves in the same position as our co-op and public power and utility cousins, which is how do we sufficiently site and permit a sufficient amount of generation of all types in order to meet the demand expectations that are there? And I know it sounds easy to come back to the issue of permitting and siting, but the issues of permitting and siting are going to dictate how successful we are in making this uh, supply demand equation balance out because you're going to continue to need additional dispatchable resources. My good friend Jim Robb was uh, at an event where he said, it's not that I love gas, I love what it can do for the system. And I think that's something that people need to keep in mind when we're trying to ensure reliability. There are performance characteristics that will be required in order to meet the, the demand requirements of data centers, but also manufacturing and chip manufacturing and all the other things that we're trying to make sure that we power all the way down to the light switch in people's homes. So we have to address in a meaningful way that permitting and siting question, because without the ability to accelerate permitting and siting, we're not going to be able to build a sufficient amount of resources or the wires in order to transport the electrons or frankly, the natural gas infrastructure that'll be needed to move the gas molecules to the plants that will be needed. Thank you. Uh, Matt Chester, Energy Central. Thank you. So with, with the load demand growing at you know an unprecedented rate and the priorities of meeting that coming to a head with you know the decarbonization, sustainability goals, and more, I'm wondering uh, how do we accomplish all of that while ensuring that the, the transition to that more robust sustainable grid doesn't exasperate energy poverty and remains equitable for all relevant communities. You know, what are some key strategies or policies being used uh, in tandem with you know meeting these goals? David Daniel Brooks, can you tackle that? Yeah, I'll take a shot. Uh, thanks, Lawrence. So, so um, all of the objectives have to be met, right? 
we've got to decarbonize. We've got to do it in an affordable way. We've got to do it in a just way. Uh, we've got to make sure that we maintain the reliability and resiliency of the system. And I think one thing, it's kind of not been stated, but we have to all realize the most affordable, time efficient way to get to the decarbonized future we want is for the electric sector to be reliable and resilient enough to be able to be the, the foundation for decarbonizing other portions of the energy economy. Uh, if if we have other URI events and those are regular and we have rolling blackouts, it's going to be difficult to justify uh, transitioning from about 20% of our total uh, energy consumption in the U.S. being from the electric sector to something that's more like 40 or 60 percent, which most models show is what is the optimal way to get there in terms of cost and efficiency. So the, the reliability and resiliency of the electric grid is not a barrier to decarbonization. It's an absolute prerequisite. And we've just got to make sure that we understand that as we're making some of these decisions. And that may mean that we have some decisions that are looking at the pace of the transition and, and the prudence that has to go along with that. And uh, we, we've mentioned on here several times, what are some of the things? It, it's accelerating new supply coming in to be able to meet that demand. Uh, we have to look at the schedule retirements. We did a we did a case study as part of a large resource adequacy uh, initiative that we just rolled out all the findings from uh, recently, uh, several case studies, six regional. One of them in Texas, we looked at adding in a near-term case, just eight gigawatts, and I say just, that sounds like a lot, but just eight gigawatts of additional large point load. Uh, and that load, if it were 100% flexible, it doesn't increase the resource adequacy risk at all. Uh, that makes sense if it's 100% flexible. But if just 10% of that is not flexible, you basically get a risk that's double what the risk would be otherwise. Uh, and, and so you start to look at what are some of the options to be able to, to mitigate that risk. And, and that what we found was there were about two gigawatts of planned dispatchable retirements that were in the case. You take those two gigawatts and you extend those out and you basically, instead of doubling the risk, you end up having the risk uh, of what adding that additional eight gigawatts was because that two gigawatts is there not just for uh, serving that load, but for other high risk hours during the year. And so th there are many options and levers, and, and I'll come back to them. I said them, I think, previously before, but flexibility of those data centers and the loads is a key. Flexibility of other load is a big low hanging fruit. What we've seen is in large studies that we've done for large integrated utilities, if you can get even just 3% of the demand onto certain combinations of technology tariff, uh, demand response kind of rates, you can actually reduce the risk of resource adequacy insufficiency significantly. And so it, you, you got to be able to, do, to look at retirements. You got to be able to look at how you can accelerate those uh, additional resources being added to the grid. And, and one last one I'll mention just before I give up the mic, that delivery system need is, is very important as well. Building transmission, we know takes four, five, six, ten years, depending on what you're looking at. Uh, being able to look at when and where some of the grid enhancing technologies make sense to get additional capacity out of the existing assets is also an important thing to take a look at. It's not a magic wand that weighs and solves all the problems, but it does have some opportunity for us to look at as well. Thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, and now we go to Evan Halper, the Washington Post again. So it's been mentioned um, a few times that the sort of disconnect of the timelines, the amount of time it takes to get new power generation up and running, the amount of time it takes to hook into the grid, and these data centers want to come up and running, be up and running in, you know, 18 months. Um, at the same time, there's national security issues. You mentioned that, like, okay, if we can't find the power here, they're going to go to the Middle East, they're going to go to Asia and try to find the power there. There's this AI race going on. And so a lot of companies that need all this power are looking at um, behind the meter technologies. They're, they're, they're looking at like, okay, can we try to figure out how to build an SMR on um, you know, the data center campus? Can we try to figure out how to get advanced geothermal um, you know, right on the data center campus? Is that, um, is that generally a positive development? Or if you have so these, these mega hyperscalers that are using you know, a gigawatt and you have a lot of them around the country and they all start going off the grid and doing their own thing, does that just add to the instability? 
We're just going to take that. Uh, I'll tackle it from, at least from our experience. Uh, you know, we, Thank you, David. on our side, what we've seen is, uh, you know, typically the data center is not doing 100% of their load uh, on site. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's a, there's a it's a mixture there, and at least you know from our standpoint, uh, we view that in a positive manner, uh, and and we're looking on the de on the de demand side as well of ways to meet, uh, frankly, not only data center load but other, uh, you know, just in terms of improvement resiliency across the system. You know, th these distributed resources make uh, make a lot of sense, and you know they're you know, a lot of times they're easier to install than a central uh, central station unit. So. So we certainly look at that. We we embrace that, and you know, again, I mean, one of the challenges, at least on the from a, at least on the co-op side, is you know we have to be mindful of all of our members, and to the extent that we have a, a data center or a large load that comes in, you know, we, we we need to make sure they're paying their fair freight, and this is definitely one way to to ensure that that happens, and it works well for the data center too, because it gives them some reliability right there immediately on their on their location. Mm -hmm. And Peter Bann. Uh, I wanted to um, maybe elevate the uh, question a little bit. And I'm, I'm wondering, as we listen to the concerns about national security issues and uh, tremendous uh, spurts in growth uh, demand, um, are we looking at a, a fundamentally dysfunctional governance process over all of these challenges uh, in, in uh, keeping the grid uh, stable and uh, keeping the supplies of power uh, adequate Be because we see these challenges and, and yet uh, in case after case and situation after situation, it's not clear who's in charge, who's responsible. Uh, and we have two political parties that that uh, can't sit down on a table and try to work this out, run a table and work this out. So uh, that's my question is, uh, is this uh, a, a essentially a uh, dysfunctional governance problem that we're looking at. Anybody want to try that? <laughs> ben, good. I, I don't know that it's a dysfunctional governance process. I think when industry is left to try and solve the problems and it is given the tools or the room to execute, I know that Dan's members do a great job of doing it. I know our members do a great job of doing it. So I think when we run headlong into industrial policy questions and whose side has to win so somebody else's side can't win, it, it's going to leave us in a very bad spot. So I think if we set the guardrails around what the objectives are and allow the utilities, the public power producers, the co-ops, and the independent power producers to fill the gaps, you can achieve the goals that the policymakers say they want to do. But you can't ask those four legs of the stool to do their job and then tell them they can't do the things that are required in order for them to achieve that outcome. If you if you try to do it that way, I can assure you that we will not be successful. So I think it, it's incumbent upon policymakers to recognize the delta between their aspirational policy goals and the operational realities of the system. So if they set the guardrails and allow industry the opportunity to perform, we have demonstrated over a century that we can meet the expectations that are uh, put upon us, but there's got to be the tools and the ability for us to perform in order to achieve those outcomes. But if I could just follow that up, Todd, um, you've been trying to get a uh, an agreement among gas suppliers and uh, power providers who depend on gas to make sure that the gas facilities are winterized so we don't have another uh, close to a crisis situation such as occurred Christmas week in 2022. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd like to ask you and and Jim Robb, um, is it possible that the gas and grid uh, sectors can be aligned in a voluntary way? Are you making, is there progress on that? Yeah, I think I would go first and Jim will correct me if I'm wrong here, but I, I think we're making incremental steps in the right direction. I, I've said it before and I'll say it again. I don't think there's a silver bullet. I'm not even persuaded there's silver buckshot because there are so many variables based on regions, access to supply, which pipelines, how many you have access to, is firm really firm, all the challenges that people have talked about for some time. 
But I do see that industry has is very aware of the challenges that exist and the importance of reliability. I saw even yesterday, Inga made the announcement that they have put together some voluntary protocols that they are utilizing amongst their members in an effort to ensure that they improve performance. So I think you're seeing the response that people would want to see from industry. It's been done certainly from our seat in initiating a conversation on a voluntary basis because we didn't want to wait for someone to tell us what to do, but saw the problem and wanted to try to engage on finding some of those solutions. Are we all the way to the finish line? No, I don't think anyone would say that we're there, but are we trying to advance the ball and make meaningful steps of progress that will help us improve performance? I think without question, the answer to that is yes. Jim, uh, I, meaningful pro Jim, meaningful progress? So I, I think the answer to that is yes, uh, with the caution. Uh, you know, what I think the uh, issue, the, the actions we've taken at NERC to uh, encourage and kind of require Todd's members to winterize their, their generation, that's a very positive first step. Uh, I think the pipelines uh, coming to the table doing on a voluntary basis, making a, a number of changes, also a very positive, uh, positive step. Very concerned about the upstream. You know, one of the core drivers of the issues you referred to in uh, Christmas week of 2022 were the freeze-offs that we saw in the Utica and the Marcellus uh, production areas, right? So we needed some way to get the producers to also be able to uh, winterize, to be able to operate and produce gas during these extreme cold events. And then the un unknown here is in the electric sector, what we've learned is that guidelines work if you don't have to make a lot of change, you don't have to invest a lot of money. Uh, but having mandatory and enforceable standards really drove a step change in the performance of the grid on a number of dimensions. So it's a question, an open question in my mind as to whether or not gas will be different and can accomplish what needs to be accomplished on a voluntary basis, or if there will need to be some sort of regulatory authority uh, put in place uh, over them, end to end, right? From uh, pr production basin to the burner tip. And uh, my hunch is that we're gonna end up discovering that the gas reliability organization that the three co-chairs of the NASB effort proposed is where we're gonna end up. Thank you. I'd like to, uh, to hear Dan Burlett speak to the same subject from his perspective as having been the Secretary of Energy. <laughs> I, I don't know that I can disagree with either Todd or Jim on this point, uh, Llewellyn. I think they've, they've, they've articulated it very, very well. My views are very consistent with theirs. Um, I don't know that I'd have anything uh, different to add. I think some progress has been made. They'll continue, we'll continue to work together. We'll continue to solve this problem. Uh, I really do appreciate Todd's earlier comments, though, uh, with regard to governance and how we approach these things. Um, you know, this industry is a remarkable industry and they're very, very capable. And I think, you know, to the extent that we will allow them, as I said earlier, there's a strong desire to meet this demand. There's a strong desire uh, to reduce emissions. There's a strong desire to produce as much energy as cleanly as possible. We simply have to let them do it. And as we think about what is important to the country, what's important to the nation, uh, it was mentioned earlier, What what's what's the What's the problem we're solving to? Is it national security? Is it climate change? Is it a, a, a 20, you know, 15 Paris goal? That's an important question for all of us to ask. And I think some of the dysfunction that you see, um, and I use dysfunction loosely, I apologize to anyone who's offended by it, uh, either in Washington or in the state capital, is that policymakers come to these questions with very d different views uh, as to what is in fact the priority. But I do think if we can coalesce around one of those, and allow the industry to work, it will produce the solutions that we need it uh, as Americans, as, as citizens of the world. They will produce the solutions. Thank you very much, Dan. I know you have to catch an airplane. So if you want to just slide away at some point, we understand and we thank you so much for having been with us uh, and for making such a huge contribution. Next question from Evan Clayton Powell the third. Headline in today's New York Times, page one of the business section, U.S. wind is in trouble. The country is now adding less wind capacity each year. It looks like it peaked in 2020. What's happening? Is this a blip or is this something that we're going to have to live with uh, going forward?
Who's going to tackle that one? Somebody. And how about <clears throat> we always go to EPRI when we don't have someone to say something because EPRI <laughs> has thought about everything at some point. Right, Daniel? <laughs> um, yeah, well, well I, I can tell you that um, you know most of the energy economy models that look at decarbonization all call for a lot of wind as part of the most optimized way to meet the emissions reductions target. So th there's no question about whether or not um, there is um, th there's a, a potential for wind to be a big part of the equation going forward. Uh, I, I think what you're seeing there, Adam, is um, wind is a little bit more susceptible to uh, to some of the issues that we've already been talking about, right? That the, the um, how interest rates and inflation have affected cost, obviously a big part of that. Um, wind tends to be more remote and requires transmission and the delays, delays, the timelines, the lead times associated with being able to build new transmission, it really just putting more pressure on wind. Um, I, I'm not a prognosticator. I, I don't know that I can say whether I think it's a blip or, or whether it's going to go forward. I, I read some of the same uh, same things that other prognosticators do say. Uh, a lot of thought out there that it probably is just uh, more of a temporary thing. But um, w wind is an important part and an important resource for uh, meeting those decarbonization targets and being able to figure out how to uh, to enable that through more timely development of transmission. Uh, is going to be an important thing. Thank you. Thanks very much. And I'd like to ask Christopher uh, what the role of the big techs will be, not only as consumers of electricity, but possibly as producers, uh, where they seem to have a huge interest in the electric space. I note uh, that Google is involved in a thing called Renew Home, which is basically DER. Uh, a virtual power plant, and that uh, Microsoft has uh, signed a purchase power agreement with a fusion company, Hellion, which is very interesting as we has, have, as yet have to see, you know, any power generated by fusion whatsoever. And uh, I read in The Economist that all of the big tech companies are talking uh, both to small modular reactor companies but also to establish utilities for a new future, a new partnership. Uh, would that be a fair thing to say there is a new partnership or is this just a curiosity by big tech realizing how dependent it is on electricity? Yeah, well, well thank you for that, Luan. And, and I think, you know, building upon uh, Dan's comments earlier in terms of, you know, which is an important question, what are we trying to solve for? Uh, and, and I think, these are not mutually exclusive targets, right? So in terms of whether or not it's Paris or decarbonization or additional capacity, we need to make sure that we're driving sustainable growth in technology, right? Of, co of course, the other factors too, in terms of production and everything else that we're trying to solve for, but I don't think we give up one for the other. And it really is a team sport to make sure that we're doing this sustainably. And I think you've sort of touched on that, that we know reducing environmental impact is going to take a concerted effort by companies, governments, uh, and people that are focused on our collective future. In terms of, you know, some of the things that you mentioned around SMR, et cetera, yes, we are absolutely innovating around on-site generation. One of the things that Equinix does today is we actually use uh, we use on-site um, fuel cells, solid oxide fuel cells that which use natural gas and convert them to electricity without combusting the natural gas. You're using far less water. They're much more efficient typically than at, than your average grid. Uh, so you've got lower emissions and so on. We really view natural gas as that transition fuel. Uh, we've recently signed an agreement with Oaklo uh, for next gen uh, next gen SMRs uh, for nuclear, uh, which will be a power purchase agreement. Essentially, we're committing to uh, 500 megawatts of electricity through a PPA with Oaklo. So I think yes, everything is really on the table uh, in allowing companies such as ours in the data center space. Uh, to to innovate and solve for using this portfolio based approach, what is really a challenge that is spurred on by technology outstripping 
our existing electricity infrastructure. Uh, so I think all, all sorts of solutions are on the table at this point, but we're exploring some of the things that you mentioned. Can I ask you, what, what is the output of the fuel cells? You know, I think they they vary. They vary. Um, they vary. We are looking at um, a full on-site generation, which would which would require a fleet of cells. We don't actually break out the specific uh, power consumption of our IDXs, as we call them, international business exchanges, uh, by site. Uh, but they do have the capability. If you have the available footprint. Uh, I would say, you know, you're going to require multiple, a dozen or so of these cells uh, to power uh, a continuous power for one of these locations. It wouldn't be one or two of them. They're relatively small modular units. Uh, Mark, before I ask uh, Jennifer to ask the last question, I wonder if there are any comments that you have in mind from your enormous experience in this field. Well, and I really do appreciate the panelists' discussion. You know, it struck me here is, you know, we keep talking about sort of a one-size-fits-all solution. But in fact, uh, as you know, <clears throat> you know, our electricity markets are not the same everywhere. So a solution in ERCOT, for example, a PJM or MISO, resource adequacy questions, they're, com they're completely different. So you might see in California, for example, uh, putting lithium ion long-term storage batteries complementing solar, for example. But in ERCOT, because it's an energy market only, you'll see two-hour batteries uh, as opposed to long-duration batteries trying to take advantage you know, of, of the peak uh, load shifts. So it's just different in all parts of the country as to how you can help solve solutions. Um, and so I think the word regionalization, you know, has been uh, talked about. I do think, too, that we can look forward to what FERC has done on the transmission policy to see how that plays out. I know uh, they've put a lot of effort into that. And so uh, I think we can turn to FERC in the future, too, and perhaps have a discussion the next time to see how, that's, how that may be solving some of our siting uh, and transmission issues. Thank you very much. Does anybody else on the panel have anything they wish to say that has not been raised? Nothing? Yes. Jim. Sure. I, I wanted to quick stop the uh, conversation around nuclear. And uh, I think the one very positive development here is the, uh, the data center interest in nuclear and potentially in advancing the uh, development of uh, small modular reactors. I mean, that's got to be a big part of our uh, low carbon future and getting, you know, guys like Gates and Bezos and Facebook and Meta and whoever else, right, that have gobs of money to really push that technology and get that into a uh, commercializable form, I think will serve this country incredibly well. So if the data center issues that we've talked about are the catalyst for really advancing our understanding of nuclear I think that's a great contribution that they're making beyond the uh, all the lifestyle and societal benefits that Christopher mentioned before. So we so should- uh, your, Sorry, sorry, big upon your feeling is that the data centers or the large tech companies might actually pull nuclear over the finish line. Thank you very much. Uh, we go now for the last question to Jennifer Hiller. I have a question about backup power, since it sounds like all of these data centers have 100% backup power. I'm not clear on why they are not flexible, and if it's because they largely use diesel backup, if that's the issue, if you would need to be on natural gas or something instead. I can speak to Northern Virginia, where it would be an air permitting issue. So under their air permits, under their DEQ air permits, they're allowed a certain number of run hours and they would need to have an expanded permit. Uh, there, is one, there is one complex that has applied and has received permitting to run longer, but to apply that across the entire region would be problematic. So at least in Northern Virginia, where it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an air quality uh, limitation, but they all, most, Predominantly, it's diesel. Predominantly, up here, it's diesel. Yeah, just building. Very much. 
Go ahead, Christopher. Yeah, thank you, Lon. Just building that real quickly. I mean, one of the things, Jennifer, that we're experimenting with uh, at Equinex is, is hydro-treated vegetable oil as a diesel replacement mm -hmm. in some of our locations. Um, supply chain, I mean, David's spot on. It really is you know, a permitting-related issue. Uh, obviously, if there were other fuels that were available, more sustainable things like you know, a hydrogen and so on, the supply chain just doesn't quite exist yet, but we are exploring with some some other more sustainable fuels as alternatives. Thanks, Luan. Apologies. For Thank that. you very much. Anybody else got anything to say? If not, we're done for this virtual press briefing. I thank my colleagues from the media very, very much in joining us. And of course, this stellar panel of top people in the utility industry. Uh, we really appreciate your taking the time to join today and share your wisdom with the press. Uh, I thank you. And Mark, you want to say farewell on behalf of USEA? I do thank you, Llewellyn, and I, I join in your comments and thanking our uh, our experts and our journalists. Uh, today's proceedings will be posted on our website. So again, uh, it will be available at usea.org. Uh, and I encourage you uh, to visit our website. And if you like what, we, what you see, please consider being a member. Uh, thank you very much, Llewellyn. Until next time. We thank you. I thank you. And uh, good luck with keeping the lights on. We need them. Cheers.